D&D, &D, and it's become popular with children anywhere from grammar school on up. Not so with a lot of adults who think it's been connected to a number of suicides and murders. The idea of the game, which is played by highly imaginative and intelligent kids, is to assume the role of one of the characters. One game can go on for weeks or even months. The problem seems to be that some kids take it more seriously than others, take it a step further, playing a character who brings them the power in a game they couldn't possibly get in real life. About two months ago, a green eyeball was seen up in the sky. This eyeball was so big it blotted out the sun, okay? These young people are playing Dungeons and Dragons. It's an enormously complicated game in which each player chooses an imaginary character he'll assume. There are dwarfs, knights, and thieves, gods and devils, magic and spells. It's a journey into a land of fantasy through complicated mazes where you use your wits to kill your enemies before they kill you, all in a quest for wealth and power. The dungeon master orchestrates and referees the game, creating scenarios both complicated and terrifying. There is no board, only the dice. I've, I've never seen dice like this. All different sides. What's six sided? What's the what's the point yeah. in that? What, what's the... uh, they're for uh, different things. The four sided is used mainly for damage from a dagger and dart, and magic users hit points. Hit points is the damage that you can take before you die. Every... There are those who are fearful that the game in the hands of vulnerable kids could do harm, and there is evidence that seems to support that view. Timothy Grice, twenty one, shotgun suicide. The detective report noted. D&D &D became a reality. Irving Bink Pulling, 16, an avid D&D &D player, a suicide. Daniel and Stephen Irwin, 16 and 12, a murder and a suicide. The police said they were obsessed with the game. James Allen Kirby, 14 years old, charged with killing his junior high school principal and wounding three other people. Police are blaming D&D. &D. Jeffrey Jaklovich, 14. Stephen Loyacano, 16, Michael Dempsey, 17, and the list goes on. The company that makes the Dungeons and Dragons material is TSR Incorporated of Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. They estimate there are three to four million kids who play the game. Last year, they grossed nearly $30 million with Dungeons and Dragons books and paraphernalia accounting for most of those sales. Gary Gygax owns the company and invented the game. Dieter Sturm is the head of public relations. There are a number of cases that have been documented where there is some connection between D&D. &D. I'm not saying that D&D &D is the cause of the death. But paraphernalia from the game has been found at the scene of the death. Notes, suicide notes referring to the game have been found. And all of these people, in a dozen or so cases, have been documented as avid D&D &D players. And you see no connection whatsoever? We see no connection for the fact that right now there's some three to four million players of the game uh, actively throughout the United States. Uh, right at this particular time, uh, 1985, teenage suicide is, is epidemic across the country with some 5,000 kids a year now taking their lives. Um, I think that uh, to say that uh, because that child uh, played Dungeons & Dragons, uh, who's to say that that child does not watch television, does not participate in, in high school sports, or what per se? I have yet to see one bit of, of valid clinical evidence to show that this has been anything more than coincidental with a disturbed child. If you found 12 kids in murder-suicide with, with one connecting factor in each of them, wouldn't you question it? And I, that's all people would do. I would certainly do it in a scientific manner, and this is as unscientific as you can get. It's nothing but a witch hunt. I but the families who have suffered the loss of a loved one would disagree. Pat and Lee Pulling and their 12-year-old daughter, Melissa. The Pullings came home one night three years ago and found Bink, their son, dead on the front lawn of their home in Montpelier, Virginia. He had shot himself through the heart with his father's handgun. Until that night, they had never heard of the game Dungeons & Dragons. Then they began looking through his things. We went into the kitchen, and there on the table were the, what we thought were just regular composition books with schoolwork in it, and much of the Dungeons & Dragons material, along with this curse he had received in the game that day that he died. 
The curse that was placed on Bink's D&D character began, Your soul is mine. I choose the time. In a letter that he left, Bink said he had been summoned to kill himself because he was evil. It was obvious through his writings that he felt he had assumed this character. But what I couldn't get into my mind was, is it possible? How could anybody do that? How could a 16-year-old that is smart, intelligent, why would they believe that they were something in a game? And why would they kill themselves? Because somebody else said to do it. Your son was well-adjusted? Always. He had never had psychological problems. He was healthy, even physically healthy. Well, we found that uh, uh, there's been numerous parents who say that uh, uh, the child's had no problems and such. Uh, very conclusively, we go back to details of uh, reports of classmates, of teachers, of friends and such, who very much uh, uh, kind of show that the youngster didn't fit in to school. Uh, he had outside problems and generally problems with his family. We know that in the case of Dungeons and Dragons, upwards of three million kids play the game with no apparent serious consequence that for them it exercises the imagination and is just good fun. But there are those who are afraid that impressionable, vulnerable kids could be harmed by it. Dr. Thomas Radecki is a psychiatrist who teaches at the University of Illinois Medical School and who is chairman of the National Coalition on Television Violence. He has been studying the game for several years and says there are 28 deaths related to Dungeons and Dragons in the last five years. In some of those, it was clearly the decisive element. In other ones, it was just a major element in the thinking of the people at the time they committed suicide or, or murder. It's not coincidence, not when you have careful documentation, you have careful notes, you have eyewitnesses. For instance, one case, the parents were actually saw their child summon uh, Dungeons and Dragons demons into his room before he killed himself. Another case, the kid had thought he had the ability to astral travel, coming from the D Dungeons and Dragons game, that he could leave his body and come back. And he had rigged it up just according to the rule book so he could do it. He was surrounded by his materials and put a bullet in his head so he could leave his body, and he's never come back. This is make-believe, and nobody's murdered, and there's no violence there. I mean, uh, to, to use an analogy with another game, who is bankrupted by losing a game of Monopoly? Nobody is, because the money is make-believe, the property is make-believe, and the bankruptcy is make-believe. It is not like Monopoly. There is no board. It is role-playing, which is typically used for behavior modification. If you are using behavior modification and you are doing violent roles and you're doing negative roles continuously, these children not only begin to have violent dreams or violent thoughts or negative depressing type things, they become very much a part of this character. You're role playing, you're rehearsing, you're developing the character hour after hour, day after day. We're really talking about intense, violent, uh, intense involvement in a very uh, serious form of violence. The important thing to remember is, if you're playing a character, let's say, for instance, you have an evil character, the rules tell you your evil character is allowed, in the scope of the rules, to murder people and to rape and plunder. If you're playing a good character, you're the defender of the people. You try to stop the people from raping and plundering. Yeah. But it's just your character that does it on the sheet of paper. When the game is over, the game does not tell you to go out and rape and plunder. Yeah. But for some kids, it's not as simple as that. Melissa claimed that D&D &D had become more than just a game for her brother, Bink. Someone it's threatened okay. you? Yes. My brother threatened to kill me one time. And we found out later that uh, he had threatened to kill her if uh, she told uh, us that he was playing the game. She knew it, and she was actually scared for her life. After her son's death, Pat Pulling thoroughly investigated the game. She felt so strongly that it was responsible for her son's death that she formed a network of concerned people to warn others about the dangerous aspects of the game. Because of her involvement with D&D, &D, Mrs. Pulling is often consulted by police departments. The has placed you in a dreadfully precarious position. You're playing the most phenomenal game ever created. Your skin grows cold from your first glimpse of the enormous beast. It's a product of your imagination. Survival depends on a quick, decisive move. Your choices are limited. Stand and fight or run. Use your lightning pole.
victory is yours. I think we're in the treasure. TSR Hobbies, Dungeons and Dragons game. Products of your imagination. Because of her involvement with D&D, Mrs. Pulling is often consulted by police departments around the country. Last November, in this deserted area outside the small town of Lafayette, Colorado, two brothers, Daniel and Stephen Irwin, 16 and 12 years old, were found dead. It was a murder-suicide. The story was widely covered by newspapers and television, as was the fact that the police said the deaths were caused by the boys' obsession with the game Dungeons and Dragons. Officer Greg Corey was assigned to the case when the boys were first reported missing. He learned that they used to come to this railroad trestle to play the game. Both boys were here when you came? Yes, the, uh, both boys were intertwined, their legs intertwined down in this area. The older boy... Um, in this area here, the younger boy laying here with the 22 caliber gun next to his head, um, where the gun was found, was just to the right of his, his head area. As a police officer, as an investigator, did you see a connection between what happened here and the game Dungeons and Dragons? And the investigation showed that it was a focal point of the boys' lives. They were just enthralled in the game. And this comes from witnesses and the family and the brother that they were totally obsessed with the game. In fact, would play it for 48 hours straight, um, sort of a marathon playing. Two weeks after the police chief announced that Dungeons and Dragons had been the cause of the boys' deaths, he issued a final press release with a different version of his earlier statements. TSR claimed they were vindicated. But Pat Pulling couldn't believe that the police changed their story. And I said, well... You can't change it. If it's the truth, you can't change it. I mean, children are dying, Ed. Children are dying out there, and people are not telling. Mrs. Pulling was convinced that it was the threat of a lawsuit by TSR rather than the evidence that made the police chief change his story. Did you threaten to sue the city? No, we did not threaten to sue. We did send them a letter, which we asked them in a very kind way, uh, that uh, they please further investigation and take a look at exactly what all the evidence is and what the details are specifically before they start uh, calling the name of our product into it as being a blame or cause. But Mrs. Pulling had received a letter from the police chief in Lafayette in which he said that it was his fear of a lawsuit that made him back off. Yes, he sent me a letter. The letter to Mrs. Pulling from the chief of police said in part, I sincerely hope you will understand what has happened and will forgive me. I do not feel very good about myself, and I feel that I have lost a part of my integrity. May I say that the city administrator and city attorney were very supportive of me, but cautious. My obligation to this city as a whole to protect them from serious financial litigation was predominant. I wept. I mean, I said, boy, you know, maybe somebody was going to really take and pay attention to this now and start doing some serious research and start stopping children from dying over something that they didn't have to die. I don't think anyone is suggesting that your intentions originally with this game were anything but, but good. It was a game to Thank have you. some fun. Mm -hmm. But in the light of what some people would consider to be strong evidence, don't you really think that you have to rethink your position about the game and at least make known the potential for abuse of the game? Well, I, I, I again have to go back and say there's no link that, that this is, except perhaps in the, in the minds of those people who are looking desperately for any other cause than perhaps their own failure as a parent for their child's death. And further, the... Uh, Anything can be abused. Are we going to try to go around and say, uh, this chair could be used by a violent person to strike another person. Therefore, it should have a warning label on it saying, caution, this can be used to assault you with. We would like an impartial uh, inquiry by the Consumer Product Safety Commission to actually look into these deaths, to call the police, call the detectives forward, bring forth the evidence, bring the parents in, look at this. Let's have an inquiry, an open public inquiry, and let's find out the truth. This Friday, the town of Putnam, Connecticut, will hold a town meeting to discuss whether Dungeons and Dragons should continue to be played in their schools. The suicide of a 13-year-old Putnam boy has once again fanned the controversy. On the phone, 
We asked two college students to call. My name is Sarah. To Sarah Maxa, he identified himself as... Tom Rudecki. To Rebecca Howland. He said he was a doctor, and I said, what kind? And he said he was a psychiatrist. But Dr. Rudecki does not tell the prospective clients who call his 800 number a piece of information that we found in the state records in Illinois. Three years ago, Illinois revoked Dr. Rudecki's license to practice medicine. The grounds engaging in immoral conduct of an unprofessional nature with a patient. In fact, the Surrogate Parenting Institute is Dr. Radecki's home in Urbana, Illinois. At first, he declined Radecki. to be interviewed. I'm Anthony Mason with CBS. But later, he and his wife consented. When people speak to you over the phone and speak to you and you introduce yourself as Dr. Radecki, do you think they have the right to know that you've lost your license? I think they, uh, certainly I would tell people that if they asked. Uh, do you tell them if they don't ask? No. No. Uh, no. You know, my name doesn't appear on any letters that go out or anything like that. It's not used as a sales technique. But in this letter, seeking business advice from Indiana surrogacy attorney Steve Litz, Dr. Radecki introduced himself, I am a psychiatrist. His conduct is um, at best a misrepresentation and more probably fraudulent. Realistically, what credentials does he have to have to do this? None. Uh, he, he, nobody has to have any credentials to have a surrogate program. And that surrogacy experts say is the problem. The industry is almost completely unregulated. Donors and couples have to rely on the ethics and honesty of those who hold themselves up to be professionals in the business. Not only has Dr. Radecki advertised all over the country for egg donors, from Yale to UCLA. I'm 19. He's also recruited college women who've never had children to consider... Surrogacy? Surrogacy. He said he thought it would be an interesting and exciting experience for me as a college freshman. But most surrogacy programs have a very different view. They're not mature enough. They have not had a chance to have their own children yet. Shirley Zager of the nonprofit Organization of Parents Through Surrogacy argues that until the industry is regulated... It's anything goes. And because of that, people like Dr. Thomas Radecki can open shop. Diane and Tom Radecki say they were only trying to help infertile couples. I suppose the public feel that we've uh, been dishonest with them. And I'm very sorry, um, but we will still continue, I think. I don't know if we'll continue. <laughs> Yesterday, the Radeckis called CBS News to say they were disconnecting their phones and going out of business. In Urbana, Illinois, I'm Anthony Mason for Eye on America. Just ahead.